live. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jay Iyer, and I'm the president of the NYU Federal Society. On behalf of the Federal Society, I would like to welcome you to tonight's administrative law study break with Professor Christopher Walker. Professor Walker is the John W. Brooker Professor of Law at The Ohio State University, Morris College of Law, and Director of the Moritz Washington DC Summer Program. At Moritz, he teaches administrative law, civil procedure, constitutional litigation, the ethics of Washington lawyering, federal courts, legal analysis and writing, legislation and regulation, and state and local government law. Professor Walker's research focuses primarily on administrative law, regulation, and law and policy at the agency level. His publications have appeared in the California Law Review, Duke Law Journal, Georgetown Law Journal, Michigan Law Review, Stanford Law Review, and University of Pennsylvania Law Review, among others. His article, Legislating in the Shadows, was selected as a recipient of the 2016 American Association of Law Schools Scholarly Papers Competition Award. His book, Constraining Bureaucracy, Beyond Judicial Review, is forthcoming with the Cambridge University Press. Professor Walker also won the 2022 Joseph Story Award from the Federal Society at this past weekend's National Student Symposium. The Joseph Story Award is given annually to a young academic, 40 and under, or 10 years on the tenure track or fewer, who has demonstrated excellence in legal scholarship, a commitment to teaching, a concern for students, and who has made significant public impact in a manner that advances the rule of law in a free society. Without further ado, I will give the floor to Professor Walker. If you have a question, please feel free to utilize the chat section or the raise hand function. Awesome. Well, thanks, thanks so much. Um, so I think this is, we're, this is a little bit of an experiment for the Federal Society, and we're going to try it out. And, and, and feel free to kind of just you know, add in questions as we go. Um, I just want to kind of introduce myself a little bit more differently. I, I, my research focuses primarily on federal administrative law, and I got interested in this. I knew in high school I wanted to work in government someday, and I had this dream of going to the Kennedy School of Government, and it wasn't until I got to undergrad that I realized law school would be, you know, a route to get there, uh, and then when I got to law school, I discovered administrative law and fell in love with it, because it's the perfect way to get into government. Uh, administrative law is, is the law that sets the ground rules for how federal agencies operate, uh, and it's just the way that we know how government's supposed to function. So if, if you like federal agencies and kind of regulatory work, that's really cool. If you like Congress, Congress plays a, a huge role in overseeing uh, what agencies do. And then of course, courts also play a, a constraining role. And so when you think about administrative law, a lot of times we just focus on what are agencies doing, but it really is a three branch problem or issue where you've got the president, uh, Congress, and the courts playing a really significant role and then the last part you have is, is, is civil society, you know, the public that plays a role in that too. And so I always tell my students, like, if you want to get into government long term, either at the state or federal level, uh, federal administrative law is, is definitely definitely an area that's a lot of fun to be at. That's all I've got. I don't know what we want to jump to questions. Or you want to? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, but, uh, one other note: they tell me to say some fun fact. It's not fun, but I think administrative law is my worst grade in law school. Um, so. Uh, you can always come and you can you can always teach it even if it's not your best class. <laughs> okay, so we're not all lost then. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, all right, cool. So, uh, you know, my first question, and I think this is kind of relevant to a lot of debates today, is um, like, what is the non-delegation doctrine? Yeah, I mean, so the non-delegation doctrine is... Um, it's, it was recognized first in the 1930s. Uh, you know, think FDR, Great New Deal, a lot of power going to the president and the federal agencies. And, and, and the Supreme Court in response said, hey, you know, when we look at the Constitution, all legislative powers here granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States. Uh, in other words, Congress is the one that's supposed to be legislating. Uh, and yet with the New Deal, you had Congress delegating a lot of power to the president uh, and to federal agencies to implement it. And so the court said in, in, in two decisions that the president uh, had too much power, uh, that too much legislative power, uh, that the courts, that the Congress had to provide an intelligible principle for, for agencies to, to be able to implement that, that they can't legislate themselves. Uh, but after that, they didn't do anything for decades. Uh, the court continued to kind of pass on these. And there's a famous decision from Justice Scalia where he basically says, 
this doctrine just doesn't do anything. Uh, you know, you can delegate even really broad in the public interest um, type delegations, and you don't have a problem with that. In recent years, though, we've seen the Supreme Court kind of try to reinvigorate it. Uh, Justice Gorsuch is probably the leading voice on the Supreme Court right now, uh, trying to find a way to, to kind of reinforce the idea that Congress is supposed to legislate and make the major policy decisions, and that agencies are supposed to play more of an implementation role. Um, we'll see if it goes anywhere. Um, you know, a, a few years back, and there's a case called Gundy versus the United States uh, that dealt with the Attorney General being able to decide whether the Sex Offender Registration Act and um, um, Notification Act applied to convicted felons, or, or sorry, applied to individuals convicted of sex offenses before the statute came to effect. Uh, whether that violated the non-delegation doctrine, and a lot of us thought that the court would, in that case, say that it did. Uh, but it ultimately kind of left it open for another day, uh, and Justice Alito wouldn't join uh, the, the, the conservatives, and there were only eight made justice court on that front. So we'll see what happens next. Uh, if you were following the OSHA vaccine or test mandate uh, decision that came down back in January, uh, Justice Gorsuch there again said that perhaps that also violates the non-delegation doctrine. But I think it's probably the biggest debate we have right now in administrative law, at least on the constitutional level. Yeah, so, I mean, with constitutional things, obviously, uh, we want to look to uh, originals, at least people of certain persuasions want to look towards originalism. So there's been a lot of scholarship on delegation at the founding. Uh, Professor uh, Nicholas Badgley and Professor Julian Davis Mortensen come to mind. Um, why should we care about the practice of delegation or non-delegation at the founding? And where do you think the, the evidence lands? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting how when you start to try to reinvigorate a doctrine, you know, when the court does, scholars take a closer look at it. And like you mentioned, you know, Julian Nick's paper is kind of the, the, large, the, the biggest attack against the idea that there was a delegate, non-delegation doctrine at the finding. Uh, and at the founding, and, and, and you know, they, 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 they come out swinging, they say there's like no evidence at all, which I, I, I think their argument is very, in some ways, you know, has some compelling points. I'm not, I'm not, it's hard for me to wrap my head around the idea that there's no non-delegation of the founding, because if you read some of the founding sources, it suggests there's at least some. Um, Alon Worman's written one response. Uh, I think we're gonna get more responses from those who are originalists, uh, you know, are trained in that. Uh, I think some of the other fascinating research on this, uh, Nick Prill has a new article that just came out of the Yale Journal, uh, sorry, the Yale Law Journal, on which he looks at like tax practices uh, at the founding. Uh, and, and, and that's an interesting, for me, that's like, all right, yeah. I mean, there's some crazy stuff going on at the federal level when it comes to assessing property taxes through a federal system. There's a lot of discretion given to local tax assessors. And, uh, and so I think that's like, I, I think the case studies are really cool. Um, now, we already have one response to that. Um, Ann Wolfander, who's a professor at the University of Virginia, has a short response. She just put up an SSR a few weeks ago that says, you know what, tax is different. It's not the same as like, and, and, and maybe we would allow for more kind of discretion given to tax collectors and tax assessors than we would to others. Uh, but it is a critical part of the debate because Justice Gorsuch grounds the non-delegation doctrine in in originalism, an original, you know, understanding of the Constitution. Uh, and if he's wrong about that, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that could be a problem. Now, you might still, as a policy matter, uh, or as a kind of formalist matter, uh, look at the Constitution and say, I don't need to find the originalism source. I can look at this more as a formal matter. Uh, and all legislative powers has that. I think, you know, maybe someone like Gary Lawson would think of it a little bit more like that, even if the historical sources aren't as strong. Uh, as, as maybe a lot of us thought they were, um, there's still a way to kind of just read the Constitution formally to, to require that. And, and I think there are really good reasons uh, as a policy matter why we'd want a non-delegation doctrine. Uh, we want Congress to make the major decisions uh, about whether the FCC can regulate the internet or not. And that's something I'd like to see Congress make or on climate change. Like you, you really want a politically accountable branch to, to be the first mover and make that big decision. And uh, and, and let the agencies kind of more fill in the details, not make the big value judgments, but kind of focus more of their expertise on, all right, Congress wants us to regulate climate change. All right, let's, let's figure out how to do it the best way as opposed to can we or should we regulate cl climate change? Those questions for a lot of us think, a lot of us think those are questions that Congress should answer. Yeah, so, I mean, 
I think that kind of goes to a, to the next major thing is the major questions doctrine. Um, how do you conceive of the major questions doctrine, especially, I guess, in light of the, the uh, oral arguments in West Virginia versus EPA, where the justices were somewhat confused about it? Um, and then the OSHA case that you mentioned. Uh, so it was like the major questions doctrine, uh, just, you know, the, the non-delegation in sheep's clothing is, to quote Justice Scalia, is it, is this, does this wolf come as a wolf? Um, <laughs> Like what, what, what is uh, the major questions doctrine and, and how does it relate to non-delegation? So the major question doctrine is super confusing. Uh, I, so originally when we talk about the major question, I'm going to stop, I think of it, I think I thought of it, I think of it as, a, as an exception to Chevron deference. So in other words, you know, Chevron deference says that courts should defer, when an agency is charged with administering a statute, courts should defer to the agencies interpretation of a re of, of a, an ambiguous statutory provision so long as the agency's interpretation is reasonable. So in other words, statutory ambiguity, if agency has a reasonable approach, we're not going to second guess it. Uh, and the major questions doctrine originally, in my mind, started with saying, all right, well, yes and no. Like before we get to Chevron, if we think that Congress, this is a major question, the statute of ambiguity invokes a major question. King v. Burwell is like kind of the classic case in my mind for this. Uh, you know, we're dealing with a statutory challenge to the Affordable Care Act. And Chief Justice Roberts from the majority says, we don't think the I we don't think Congress would have given this decision to the IRS about whether tax credits are available in exchanges established by the federal government. It's a really big question. The agency doesn't have the expertise to answer it. Uh, and so we're going to answer it, which is a little bit weird. When you talk about it like that, I don't know why they would have more comparative expertise, but 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 we're not going to defer to the agency there. And so originally that's what we thought the major questions doctrine was. Um, but Justice Kavanaugh, when he was on the D.C. Circuit, took it to another level, uh, at least I think he took it to another level, um, in a case deciding whether the, the FCC could regulate the Internet, the net neutrality cases. He wrote a dissent and he said, major questions doctrine, that Congress had not expressly told in the statute, told at the FCC they could regulate the Internet. Uh, and instead of saying we're not going to defer uh, to the agency's interpretation, he said that the agency shouldn't have the regulatory authority in the first place. So it's not like it's not it's still a, an interpretive tool and not a like a constitutional doctrine, but it's not about deference anymore. It's about whether the agency can do it at all. So under kind of Justice Kavanaugh's approach, he would say that if there's a statutory ambiguity and it raises a major question about whether the agency can regulate, uh, the agency can't regulate uh, that, that that issue. It's got to, Congress has got to make that decision. And he didn't make it out of whole cloth. Some of you read probably Brown and Williamson, the kind of famous case uh, about whether the FDA has the ability to regulate uh, tobacco. Uh, you, you see it there a little bit too. Um, but then it took another turn in January. And Justice Gorsuch in his separate concurrence uh, with the OSHA case, does OSHA have the authority to impose a vaccine or test mandate on all large employers? Um, he said no major questions, and he said that's what the majority said as well, and I think he's probably right, Well, the majority didn't really spell it out as clear. Uh, but then he also said that this is basically the equivalent of the non-delegation doctrine. Um, uh, in other words, we're really talking about uh, not just is it a major question, but if it is a major question and Congress doesn't provide the answer, that could potentially be a non-delegation doctrine violation. So we went from exception to Chevron deference to a tool of statutory interpretation, like a substantive canon, to the constitutional doctrine, the non-delegation doctrine, uh, in just a few years. And it'll be interesting to see if the court embraces that. Justice Kavanaugh suggested maybe that's a path, like a few years back when he first joined the court. He said, well, maybe for the non-delegation doctrine, we should look at this. I think it's really fascinating, though. He didn't join ju ju Justice Gorsuch's separate writing in the OSHA case. Uh, so even though he kind of hinted this might be the path forward, he wasn't willing to embrace at least, you know, at least join the spec the concurrence on that front. So we'll see how, how it plays out. But like you mentioned, it's now in the West Virginia versus EPA case, kind of front and center. Uh, there we're dealing with, you know, with, with, with you know, air, you know, so we're back to where we were with kind of climate change issues and air and, and clean power plant issues there. And, and we'll see how the court, you know, embraces that and kind of advances it more. I, I don't know like what you think, but I mean, from a, like, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Is it a matter of like administrative governance or policy? Do we want judges to be jumping in and kind of making the major policy decision themselves uh, as opposed to an agency? 
Is it going to actually help Congress to legislate more? Is that the goal? Like, is the goal to say, we don't want the agency to answer these questions and by us answering them, it forces Congress to do it? I don't know. I mean, it's interesting to kind of think through what the court's end game is. But ultimately, maybe they just think it's unconstitutional. Uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, that these types of delegating major questions to decide whether to regulate or not in a particular area, uh, that they just don't, they think it's unconstitutional. So I think it's, but the evolution of it from a Chevron exception to a constitutional doctrine is, I think, a really fascinating one. Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, I think especially with the uh, the OSHA case, maybe we can, there, there's stuff to talk about with like the shadow docket or emergency docket. Um, <laughs> you got to get your branding right. You got to get your branding right. <laughs> um, but I don't think that that's the, I don't think people came here to talk about uh, that. So let's, <laughs> you mentioned Chevron. Let's, let's maybe talk a little bit about Chevron. Um, so you know, Chevron deference, you mentioned it gives relatively broad authority for agencies to interpret, to give reasonable interpretations to ambiguous statutes. So some commentators uh, have noted that the current court defers less to agency interpretations. Uh, I'm going to ask you point blank, is Chevron dead? Uh, if it's not dead, is it dying? Um, if so, what is its replacement? I mean, and, and I'm, and specifically like for an eye to someone who might be taking an admin law exam in May, you know, <laughs> what do you do with a dead or dying doctrine um, on that, on that like final exam? Yeah, well, I think you still apply it and walk through it, um, like through the steps and do the dance. Um, so, I, so with Chevron, this was a big conversation about, you know, six years ago, um, it, you know, for until about six years ago, for a decade, judges and scholars, largely those like right of center, the you know, libertarians, started to attack the idea of Chevron deference. You know, it's, it's interesting because Chevron deference originally, the, the case is from 1984. It's in the middle of the Reagan, Reagan deregulatory movement. Uh, and it was about the EPA creating more flexibility for businesses to comply uh, with, with environmental, with the Clean Air Act. Uh, so it's a very deregulatory move. And the court says, hey, agencies can kind of do a 180 even if they want, as long as there's an ambiguity. We're going to allow agencies to interpret their statutes as long as, and it's reasonable to kind of go within a realm of reasonableness. So for a long time, it's funny, in the 80s, you had folks like maybe Cass Sunstein and others attacking Chevron and saying, this is awful. Like, we should read the statute, give it its best interpretation. Uh, and, 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 and so while, it, and, then, and then it kind of, in the 90s, kind of everyone kind of fell in love with Chevron. And then the 2000s, especially Obama's second term, <laughs> I think a lot of the conservatives, you know, those right of center kind of soured on Chevron. And we're like, no, like, I think there are a number, like there, there, there are at least kind of a number of different explanations for that. Uh, you know, one is they worried that this encourages Congress to overdelegate. So it's an article one concern, okay, that, you know, whether that's unconstitutional or not, we just don't like the idea that if Congress knows you can give a lot of power to an agency, they can pass the buck, they can take the credit for the agency win and blame the agency for its loss. Um, the other thing that bothered judges is that for some judges that made them feel like they didn't have, they didn't exercise their article three judicial power. You know, they wouldn't say what the law is. They were kind of forced to kind of agree with an agency interpretation that seemed less faithful to the most natural interpretation of the statute. Uh, and, and that bothered them as well. I'd add another layer on that Congress also just wasn't updating the statutes and wasn't legislating as much, at least that was a perception. And so Chevron, maybe you'd feel good and I'd feel pretty good if I knew that if we got it wrong as a court or as an agency that Congress would come back and like change it. Uh, and I think some conservatives saw like the Obama administration do some pretty aggressive statutes that didn't seem like maybe they're within the ambiguity, but like not really. Uh, and, and so they, they, you know, they, they were pushed back uh, and think this isn't the right approach. Um, what happened is we thought we might get rid of some of these deference doctrines and we could talk about our, we had a case about our, and ultimately the court didn't get rid of it, they kind of redid it. Um, but instead what the court has done is that, well, one, we get to the Trump administration and the Trump administration, I think, largely agrees with the court on Chevron, with the conservative side of the court on Chevron. A lot of the judges that they that the Trump administration appointed um, don't believe in Chevron, or at least are very skeptical of Chevron. 
And maybe not surprisingly, the Justice Department didn't seek Chevron deference much during the Trump administration. So we had like four years where the, it wasn't make, the questions weren't making it to the court because they weren't asking for deference. They were saying this is the best interpretation, it's clear and the like. I think we're going to start seeing it more though in the Biden administration. Uh, I think we're going to start seeing the Justice Department and the Biden administration asking for Chevron deference more. And this is going to come right back up to the court um, and, and we're going to have that kind of conversation. And on a final exam, at all three steps of Chevron, you've got to be thinking about this. First, we have the step zero, which is, includes the major questions doctrine. Uh, it also includes like me, which I don't want to go into, but you probably had to read that for administrative law. Uh, and so they, they tightened up that step zero and said, hey, if it's a major question, we're not going to defer. At step one, uh, Justice Gorsuch has followed Scalia's kind of lead and kind of taken that mantle of finding every statute unambiguous. <laughs> you know, like in one case, he says, like, the question isn't whether it's ambiguous, but he doesn't say that part. I say that part. The question isn't about whether it's ambiguous. It's, is it clear enough? I, you know, clear enough to me, not ambiguous. That's like, do I, am I like confident enough that it's clear? And then at step two, Justice Kagan uh, has um, adopted an arbitrary and capricious approach to Chevron in opinions for the court. So before we're like, what does reasonable even mean? The only guidance we got from Chevron itself is that it can't, it doesn't have to be the court's best interpretation. It can be any kind of range of interpretations that are reasonable. But Justice Kagan says it's that plus the agency can't have acted in an arbitrary and capricious manner, barred from the Administrative Procedure Act standard of review. Uh, so you've got a new doctrine where as you walk through each of those steps, and additionally kind of saying there are questions about whether uh, it, it should remain on, you know, remain the law of the land. When you go through each of those steps, the court's done some pretty dramatic things to, to narrow the reach uh, of, of deference. One thing I will say, and it, this probably won't be on your final, but for those kind of old fashioned judicial conservatives, what about like statutory stare decisis? You know, I think the push to get rid of Chevron deference um, you really got to think about uh, if it's an interpretation of the Administrative Procedure Act, for instance, do we just brush it aside right away or should we care about the fact that it's been on the books since 1984 and has been repeatedly affirmed and applied in unanimous decisions of the Supreme Court for the last almost four decades? And I, I think that matters a lot in this debate uh, and, and is one that probably doesn't make it on your final exam unless it's a policy question, but should be something that you're thinking about in, in, in terms of the court's role in shaping administrative law. Awesome. Uh, I mean, another thing, could you just give us like a brief overview of the other kinds of deference? And like you mentioned, I don't remember how to pronounce it. Our, uh, or, or something. Yeah, it's but, our deference, yeah. So so the, the, the kind of, when you think about deference, well, on the Chevron front, there are kind of three levels. When you're talking about statutory interpretation, you've got Chevron deference, which is, you know, we talked about, like, and that's probably the most deferential approach. If Chevron doesn't apply, the general understanding is the next level is Skidmore deference, which is more of a standard than a rule, like Chevron's a rule, like here's two steps apply. And Skidmore deference is like, look at a bunch of different factors and does the agency's interpretation have the power to persuade? So it, some people think that doesn't matter. I think it matters a lot. It's more than de novo review, which would be like the third category. Uh, I think that Courts do find agencies persuasive because they help draft the statute. They've got the expertise, you know, scientific or economic or policy expertise in the area. And they grapple with the statute every day. So they have kind of craft expertise on how to implement the statute. And so like I did a study three years back with Ken Barnett of, of, George, of the University of Georgia Law School, where we read every single, don't ever do this, by the way. We read every single Chevron decision from the circuit courts over 11 years, like, like 2,500 decisions. And you saw like, you won about 75% of the time when Chevron applied, about 65% of the time when Skidmore applied, and 40% of the time when they said it was data over review. So that's on the Chevron front. When it comes to statutory interpretations, those are kind of the deference levels. When it comes to regulatory interpretations, so do we defer to an agency interpretation of its own regulation? That's our deference. Uh, and there the court said uh, back in a really old decision in Seminole Rock that we should, the court should defer to agencies' interpretations of their own regulations unless they're plainly inconsistent with the regulation, which is, a, in my mind, a super deference approach. Like, plainly inconsistent is different than reasonable. Um, uh, the court was asked to reconsider that in a case called Kaiser versus Wilkie a few years back. Uh, a lot of us thought they would, that they'd overturn our deference. 
Uh, but Justice Kagan got the opinion in that case, and she wrote a, a, a five-step approach to our deference, which will probably put you all to sleep. But but she narrowed, in my mind, she narrowed it significantly, gave courts more opportunities to kind of jump in and say that they're not going to defer to an agency's regulatory interpretation. No, thank you for pronouncing Kaiser for me, because I did not know how to pronounce that. <laughs> what the, what the, the sole benefit of this? Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm well, I think we've got a question in the chat. Yes, we do. Um, so uh, here's, uh, let me just read the question out. Um, could you speak to where you see the removal authorities case law moving, particularly after state of law, uh, CF, CFPB, Collins v. Yellen, and uh, Free Enterprise Fund? Um, will the court revisit its opinion in, in Humphrey's executor and its quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial uh, distinction? And this is great because this is the next topic I wanted to cover. Awesome. So, so this is a really fun topic. When we talk about removal authority, what we're talking about is, does the president, and it's kind of two questions. One, under the Constitution, does the president have the ability to fire uh, members of the executive branch, heads of the departments, agency adjudicators, and you know, anyone in the executive branch? And if the, even if the president does have the power to do that, does Congress have the ability to condition removal uh, and say, President, you can fire, but only for good cause or only for negligence, willful, you know, like you see different statutes with different approaches. Uh, and and over, over the decades, actually, since the founding, you've seen Congress impose removal restrictions on certain, certain agency officials. For instance, administrative law judges can only be fired for a cause. And they actually have to go through a merit-based process. It can't be fired by the agency head. More classically, what you're learning in your administrative law class are independent agencies. Uh, and we usually think of those more as like multi-member independent agencies. Uh, and Humphrey's, in Humphrey's executor, uh, the court said that, yeah, Congress could say for multi-member independent agencies, that the president could only remove those individuals, fire them for cause. In recent years, the court's been chipping away on this. In SALA law versus CFPB, their Congress created like a really, really powerful financial regulator uh, that was directed, headed by a single director that was movable only for cause. Uh, and Chief Justice Roberts writing for the courts that, no, no, you can't do that. Uh, that that multi-member commissions, independent agencies will leave Humphrey's executor in the books, but we're not gonna expand it in his mind, which a lot of other people thought was a creative way to frame it. We're not gonna extend that precedent to single-headed uh, agencies. Uh, and, and the fun thing about this is, Right after that case, one of my regular co-authors, Aaron Nelson from BYU, gets a call from the Supreme Court. Um, there was another case coming down the pipeline dealing with the Federal Housing Finance Agency, uh, which is another agency that was created after the big recession and like housing bust of the early 2000s. Uh, and that one was to regulate uh, um, Fannie and Freddie, the big, the big mortgage you know, companies. Uh, and he, the Trump administration said, we're not going to defend the constitutionality of this removal restriction. We think that it, under state of law, uh, it's, you know, it's not, you know, it's not constitutional. Uh, and so the court asked, appointed Aaron, my professor Nielsen, to, to defend the constitutionality of that agency. And he listed me as a co-counsel. And we spent the fall, one, the one before last, drafting the brief and preparing for argument. And we tried our best. <laughs> we made every argument we could, but we lost bad. Uh, even Justice Kagan wouldn't agree with us. Uh, I mean, she. I mean, she agreed. What better said? She. She joined. She didn't join the majority's opinion because uh, she didn't like that they wiped out any limiting principle from it. Because before it was like single-headed director of an agency that ex exercised significant executive authority, uh, and after that, in in the in the Collins case, Collins v. Yellen. Court just said, Justice Alito from the court just said, no, uh, <laughs> no more of this. Uh, and we had a part of our brief where we're like, the parade of horribles at the end, which by the way, never put in a brief if you're afraid they're gonna roll against you because it just kind of provides a roadmap. <laughs> but we said, oh no, what about the head of the Social Security Administration and the Office of Special Counsel and maybe even like members of multi-member commissions, independent commissions. And sure enough, like two weeks later, the Justice Department um, issues, the Office of Legal Counsel issues an opinion saying that President Biden can fire the head of the Social Security Administration at will. And like the next morning, President Biden fires the head of the Social Security Administration. So we're in this world now where I think it's really clear that the statutory moral restrictions of agency heads, of principal officers at least, that the only ones that 
that are still good law are independent commissions, uh, Humphrey's executor. Uh, and, and I think it's probably safe to say that the only thing that's standing in the way of the court to overruling Humphrey's executor is stare decisis. Uh, uh, and you saw a case earlier this year, um, Paul Clement brought a case challenging um, some uh, SEC administrative law judges. Uh, and, the, and, and they presented this question. The court granted the case, but didn't grant that question. So they seem to kind of be putting that Humphrey's executor question on hold for a while, but I think it's only a matter of time until we get there. Um, the other kind of issue here is, what do you do with inferior officers? You know, can they have removal protections? Uh, I think the, 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 you know, the black letter law is that yes, they can have good cause removal protections, um, but the court has said in free enterprise by the other case mentioned in the comments that they can't have double layer protection. So you can't like have an agency head that has good cause removal protection and someone below them has good cause removal protection. One of those two has to be removable at will. Uh, and so there are lots of big questions about that. But what do we do with administrative law judges? What do we do with, you know, other types of inferior officers that have good cause removal protections? I think this is a good time to ask. Um, what's an officer? What's an inferior officer? <laughs> I mean, we have Lucia v. Lucia, Lucia v. SEC um, and Morrison v. Olson. Uh, what's an inferior officer? What's a, what's a principal officer? What's not an officer? Yeah, so when you get to the, in the Constitution, it, it, you know, it, it says that the president shall nominate and with the advice and consent of the Senate, certain officers, uh, and then, but then it has a carve out at the end but for inferior officers, Congress gets to choose. They can leave it to the president, to pre you know, presidential appointment and, and Senate confirmation, that's the default, or they can give it to the president alone to appoint to the head of a department, uh, like you know, secretary of like, defense, or to um, a court of law. Uh, and so from that, we learn that principal officers are those that aren't inferior officers, <laughs> you know? um, and, and, and that's that dynamic. Now, what's not in the Constitution or what about kind of mere employees, like civil servants? And at least so far, the court has said, those aren't officers in the United States. Officers in the United States have to exercise, um, you know, exercise authority of the United States on a continuing basis, not temporary. And, and principal officers, we learn, uh, or inferior officers, we kind of learned from last year in the United States versus Arthur's case, uh, that they also can't have final decision-making authority, or at least, I don't want to go that far. The, the court suggested that perhaps that, that's a requirement. They, they kind of dodged it a little bit. But, but so we're in a world now where if an agency a, official exercises the power of the United States on a continuing basis and has final decision-making authority, they're almost for sure a principal officer. Uh, and if they don't have final decision-making authority, they're otherwise kind of below someone else that is a principal officer, then they're going to be inferior officers. But I wish it were that easy. As you all probably learned when you got your administrative law course, there's just a lot of confusion on you know, how to kind of separate out these two. For, for decades, we thought administrative law judges were just employees. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, that Lucia case, you know, Justice Kagan writes the opinion for the court and says, no, actually, they're, they're officers in the United States. They're at least inferior officers in the United States uh, because they exercise continuing authority uh, under the law. So. Kind of think of it as like officers have some policy making authority or some type of uh, ability. I don't want to say to bind, but to kind of make decisions that have you know consequence. Whereas employees or those who kind of work under them, civil servants and the like, that kind of fit into that system. Okay, thank you. I mean, uh, so so what what so where where does uh. Morrison v. Olson fit in. Maybe I'm just saying this because when I read Morrison v. Olson, I was very confused at the outset. So I'm wondering if you could give shed some light on that. Yeah, I mean, so Morrison v. Olson is a frustrating case because it's both an appointment case and a removal case, right? So this is the uh, independent counsel statute uh, that was created after Nixon, after Watergate, uh, where the attorney general, if they had, if the attorney general had suspicion that there was corruption within the executive branch. Uh, that he would have to appoint independent counsel. Uh, and, and it's a weird structure where the, a special part of the DC circuit would kind of monitor and kind of supervise the independent counsel. The attorney general still had some control over it as well. Uh, and you've got Ted Olson that refused to respond to a subpoena from the house, from one, one of the committees in Congress. Uh, and they brought 
the Attorney General appointed the independent counsel in that. Uh, and so that's how the case kind of started. Uh, and, and the question were, was, is this person an inferior principal officer? Um, and can, can it, does this person have to be more freely removal by the president or by the Attorney General? Uh, and it's super confusing. Obviously, this is where you get Justice Scalia's famous dissent, uh, you know, kind of saying, no, 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 like, this person has to be, this, this has to be unconstitutional because it's a principal officer, or at least an inferior officer, that, that, that should be removable more freely. Um, and the majority kind of takes a whole different approach and has a you know, more functional, here are the four things we should look at, you know, how broad is the jurisdiction, how much removal authority is there, you know, what's the scope of, the, of that official's power. Uh, and it's kind of a pretty unsatisfying standard instead of a bright line rule. Um, I, I think that we're chipping away at that. You know, the Supreme Court has adopted much more, since then, more bright line rules to figure out what, when someone's a principal officer, inferior officer, and also to figure out when someone should be removable, uh, not, you know, not removable for cause. We have to, you know, remove restrictions aren't, aren't appropriate. Um, not doing justice to the case. I, I think you've got to kind of read it in context of the, uh, you know, these other cases we've been talking about uh, to see how it fits in. Uh, but, but, you know, one of the most frustrating things about it for me when I teach it is, you know, the court says it's an inferior officer, and if it's an inferior officer, then you can't have a four-cause removal protection. I mean, that's pretty subtle law still. Uh, but Justice Scalia doesn't think it's an inferior officer. He thinks that the person's a principal officer and, and that you can't have four-cause removal for that. So when you're trying to kind of separate out those two questions, it's really important to kind of look at them. All right, what did both the majority opinion and the dissent say on appointment uh, or you know, officer status? And what did the majority dissent say on removal? And try to separate those out so you can see you know, how that works out. I mean, one of the most frustrating things about the majority opinion is it seems to apply the same standard to both the removal and the appointment question or the officer question, uh, which kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so. That makes sense. So, I mean, staying on appointments, um, so Buckley v. Vallejo is the FEC case. Um, that is also a precursor to Citizens United, but that's separate, I guess. But uh, that, uh, could you could you explain the ruling with regards to um, you know executive branch officers who are appointed by a separate branch, not through advice and consent, advice and consent? Yeah, I mean, so that and the Buckley case is just weird. Or, I mean, it is now. I mean, when you read it, like it, at least the way we covered in class, we kind of start there. You're like, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. Could 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 you have the you know the different leaders in Congress, both the House and the Senate, choose members to serve on this committee? Could you have like the secretary of this, you know, and, uh, and, and it's kind of fun to think about, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, just kind of thinking, of, well, you know, maybe, I mean, if, if the goal is to create a level of independence, which with the Federal Elections Commission, uh, Congress wanted to, you know, they didn't want federal elections when it comes to campaign finance laws to be kind of fully controlled by a president who's going to run for re-election or his party is going to, you know, run for re-election and have that kind of be too close to the president's control. So Congress tried to make it really independent. Say, all right, President, you get to choose a couple. The Senate and the House leaders get to choose a couple. Uh, and the goal was to, like, the way it was set up with how it had to get approved by both the House and the Senate was to try to kind of get folks that would be as mainstream as possible, like as kind of as apolitical as possible. Uh, and the court just looked at that and said, no, there's no way you could do that. I read the Appointments Clause and it says, President nominates, Senate confirms. Um, and the president appoints. It doesn't say the House does anything here. And it also doesn't say the Senate or the House can appoint. Uh, and so we've got to just follow that text uh, and, 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 and let, have give the president kind of the full power to do that. Um, and I, that's, that's where, you know, that's kind of where, where, where we ended up with at least the start of this. Um, that's a lot easier than the other questions we talked about because at least you've got a textual hook in the appointments clause that seems to su suggest pretty strongly that the president is the one that's appointing. Yeah, definitely. I think appointment removal is a always a very fun thing to talk about. Um, and you know, we I think we we've gotten through like forty minutes of this, and we have mentioned the APA once, <laughs> and I think it was kind of like in passing. So I think we should probably talk about the APA, given that it's a big thing in administrative law. Um, so when do so so 
when do agencies go through notice and comment and stuff like that that is required by the APA? When can they skip that? And then what are the like substantive requirements when they uh, go through notice and comment? Like that's a, that's a large question if you wanna go through that and- Yeah, well, I mean, so I think it's got good to start with, you know, the Administrative Procedure Act was this grand compromise, as you know, scholars have called it in 1946, so post New Deal. It took more than a decade to, for Republicans and Democrats um, to come together and figure out, like, well, this is the quasi-constitution of, of the administrative state. So these are, these are the, as I tell my students, they're the default rules for how agencies have to act and how courts review those actions. And I say they're default because as an administrative lawyer, you know that's the backdrop, but agencies organic or governing statutes can provide a lot more detail. Uh, they might require a whole different process or they might tell courts to review a different, at a different standard of review. Uh, and so I think it's always important. You got to know the APA, but you also have to look at the organic statute. And also don't ever just read the Administrative Procedure Act because it turns out that it, 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 the way court, the court, the, the Supreme Court and the DC Circuit and other lower courts have interpreted it, it looks nothing like the text. Uh, and one of these examples is notice and comment rulemaking. So notice and comment rulemaking says, H has got to provide a general statement uh, of, of purpose with what they're trying to do, uh, just a notice. They've got to allow for public comment, and then they provide a concise and general statement of basis and purpose for the final rule. Uh, and it turns out that it's not like that at all. It's not this kind of really quick process. Um, the agency at the outset has to provide like a detailed rule and explain everything they, they consider what they're thinking about. Um, they've got to disclose to the public any kind of factual evidence or data that they're using. None of that's in the APA itself. The courts read it into the APA in order to allow for um, the public to meaningfully participate. And then the public gets the comment period. The APA doesn't say how long. We usually think at least 60 to 90 days, but the courts, courts have less 30 days um, where they get to comment on it. Uh, and the agency kind of collects all those comments. And eventually um, you have, um, 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 you have a, uh, the agency has to respond to all the comments. Uh, and you've got this long you know, preamble or statement of basis and purpose that's anything but concise or general. Uh, and that's the process that works. And it's driven in part because the court said the agency has to do this, but it's also driven a lot by the fact that the court, a court's gonna review it later and make sure that the agency engaged in reasoned decision-making along those lines. So I think that's, that's, that's kind of the, today that's the predominant mode of rulemaking, like formal rulemaking is, is seldom used by any agency anymore. We, that's a conversation for another chat maybe, uh, but that's, that's what courts are looking at. That's what the agencies are doing when you go through notice and comment rulemaking. So you mentioned, so do, do agencies have to respond to every single comment that they, they give? I mean, I know people with, you know, the internet, you can, you can kind of put down a comment on an agency rulemaking. So if I, if I go to the EPA's most common, uh, most, most recent rulemaking, uh, most recent like uh, proposal for notice of comment, can I just say something and then they have to respond to me? Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of the, there's like the famous FCC net neutrality where John Oliver goes on TV and is like, here's the email to submit your comment the FCC. And he got like millions of comments, including lots of like Russian bots that were commenting. Uh, so no, the, the, what courts have said is that agencies have to respond to any significant comment. Um, and so, you know, they'll go through all the comments, they'll try to group them. Sometimes they use AI to kind of sort through all the comments. Uh, and they try to identify which ones are significant. Uh, and if they don't respond to significant comment, they can get overturned by courts. So they're going to be, maybe they'll kind of over, over include comments. But if it's just kind of random, small statements of like, I don't like this rule or this or that, uh, that that's, not, that's, not, that's not important. I think mm -hmm. one thing that's interesting, some scholars view this as somewhat of a direct democracy approach. Mm -hmm. I'll confess, I don't, I've never fully understood or bought that, but like, Maybe we should actually count up votes, you know, what people are saying, or maybe we should be swayed by how many comments are for or against the particular rule. Uh, that's not what the court says they have to do. The court says you just have, you have to respond to significant comments. And you can imagine if you're regulated in you know, company, you're going to get your own experts, submit expert reports. You're going to kind of lodge those to hopefully try to convince the agency to do something different, but perhaps even more importantly, to lay the trap for the court to say that the, that the, you know, that the agency didn't, didn't did consider the comment in a reasonable way. So, 
I mean, it, you could also say the, say, say the same thing that if you're a student in a law school clinic where you want to have a uh, the court uh, read read your writing or uh, have the agency read your stuff. Um, yeah, I think everyone should submit at least one comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like when you submit a significant comment, um, how like how does the agency have to respond? Uh, I know you know you mentioned notice and comment uh, is not that common, but in this like you know in this space, like if you do submit a very significant comment that has studies and experts that that are talking about the specific rulemaking at issue, uh, how does the agency have to respond and like? To one end, they have to substantively refute things. Yeah, I mean, so I, I mean, maybe it'll be this fun. I think it's really fun to read the preambles to final rules because a lot of times they'll have, you know, they'll, they'll go through and they talk about the changes they made. So oftentimes, they make changes from the proposed rules in the final rule, and then they usually have a whole separate section that says like responses to comments, <laughs> uh, and you can just go through and you'll see a paragraph or a few sentences. Now, of course, they're not going to review it and say, oh, who has the better argument? That's not what they do. They review it to see, did they respond to it? So they might say, hey, AT&T filed this comment. Uh, they made these arguments. We just decided as a matter of policy, this is more administrable or it makes more sense. We're not going to do what they said. And they're like, you're kind of done. Um, of course, going to ask, did the agency engage in reasoned decision making? Like, uh, But they're not going to ask who has the better argument. They're not going to weigh evidence. They're not going to. Uh, they just want to see that the agency actually read the comment, thought about it, and decided not to adopt it. Or vice versa, some they say we are adopting it, or we're not going to adopt it all the way, but they make a good point, so we're going to include this like clarification in the final rule, things like that. So if you look through it, they almost always have like a separate little section that talks about responses to comments. And the big comments they might include in, in the discussions, like in the more general discussion, but to kind of cross your T's and dot your I's. They often have that kind of additional section of here are our responses, all the significant comments. Um, I know this is kind of going a little off. I mean, this is still administrative law, but this is a little off the, the notice and comment thing. Um, so to what extent can a court bring in um, evidence that is uh, of, of like rational and reasonable decision making that is not in the record? I'm thinking specifically of the census question case. That came down. Um, I guess it was a couple of years ago now. That feels very recent, but you know. Yeah, I mean, so the general rule is that the 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 agency has to make its decision based solely on the administrative record, and that the court only reviews the administrative record. So uh, there are kind of two related or three related points here. One, you know, a lot of times I work with the Justice Department civil appellate staff for a while. We're defending agencies, and a lot of times when you get one of these, you're like. I have such a better argument than the agency made. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, they had good arguments. I've got a really good argument that could win. And the court in the Chenery decisions back in the 1940s said, no, no, like, it, you can't raise the argument for the first time on appeal and litigation. You, the agency itself during the rulemaking or, or during the agency process has got to provide that reason. Um, and similarly, if uh, the court thinks the agency got it wrong, uh, in the Chenery cases, they said, you court can't provide the reason either. You cannot provide the relief. You've got to just say you got it wrong. And we're sending it back to the agency under the ordinary remand rule. So you have these kind of constraints on the agency. You have constraints on uh, on the court, and then you have constraints on the litigant, the regulated party that's challenging it, of saying, "Hey, you know what? We're generally not going to look outside the administrative record. Like if you think there's something else the agency's hiding that they've got, you know, internal documents or other things like that." The general rule is we don't look to those. Uh, we're only going to look at the official reasons that the agency gave. Um, in the census case, though, it was a weird case. The district court allowed for discovery, um, saying, hey, we don't think the Secretary of Commerce is being very honest here. Like These are not the reasons why they want to add the citizenship question to the census. We think they're political reasons. We think there might be reasons about um, trying to you know, to, to, to redistrict in a way that favors Republicans. And so they actually allowed discovery in the district court level, and it did reveal some emails and other you know, communications that suggested that maybe those weren't the only reason <laughs> for why the Secretary of Commerce issued that decision. Uh, and when I got to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court kind of said, you know, again, our general rule is we don't allow reasons. 
But here we have a record that includes the reasons because the parties had discovery and they didn't, you know. And so we're going to look at those reasons and we're going to say that if reasons are pretextual, um, then you can look beyond the reasons given. Um, and Chief Justice Roberts was trying so hard to make this case like good for today only, you know, if not. Um, but you've already started to see it used by lower courts to say, all right, no, um, you know, regulated agencies will say this is pretextual. We've got to have discovery. We've got to look into kind of the reason giving more generally. Uh, and, and so I think you're starting to see some of that creep up. Now, Supreme Court hasn't done that yet. I mean, you know, they haven't, they haven't done it again. So it'll be interesting to see if the Supreme Court uses, you know, take it good for today only, or if they view it as something, something that has a larger effect. Again, general rule though is we just look at the administrative record and the reasons given the administrative record. Uh, and we don't allow like the litigant to kind of probe the mental processes of the agency officials who, who, who formulated that final decision. That makes sense. Uh, so, you know, back on the, the notice and comment train, when and how do agencies usually skip notice and comment? Like you mentioned, that is kind of the, the norm for today. Um, so there are, in the Administrative Procedure Act, uh, there, there are kind of six different categories when you don't have to go through notice and comment rulemaking. Um, there are the, if it deals with the military or you know, and the like, or foreign affairs, if it deals with a really broad category like grant making and other, there's like an exception there, you don't have to go to the notice and comment rulemaking. Um, and then um, there are the three big ones of, uh, of interpretative rules, policy statements, um, and oh my goodness, I'm liking on the third one. Oh, procedural rules. Uh, and there, they also say you don't have to go through it for those three. And that's a that's hard stuff. <laughs> you know, we can walk through this if you want, but but they're like figuring out what they are. And the basic idea there is that if it's a procedural rule, it doesn't bind the public. It only tells the agency how to work. And think like Erie Doctor, maybe really bad memories from CIPRO. Um, the second category is if it's um, um, a policy statement, like it's a forward looking. This is. Where we're going to have enforcement priorities like under 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 the deferred action program there's a separate memo that talked about that it's not binding it's just kind of a forward-looking statement and then interpretative rules similarly it's not binding it's just the agency is telling the public how they're going to apply that regulation that statute how they're going to interpret it and, and enforce it and then the last category so we've got those five is the good cause exception um uh and their agencies skip i mean I, I, and, and the rate that they skip is quite high uh, they don't go through notice of comma and they, they, they justify it based on good cause and say it's unnecessary, impractical, or contrary to the public interest. Uh, and, and that's controversial. Of course, don't know quite well how to review this, as you might remember from Mystery of Law. Like, of course, we're kind of all over the place. What counts as good cause? How much does the agency have to explain it? And then what's the remedy? Do we require post promulgation notice and comment? Do we actually vacate the rule? Do we not vacate the rule just for man without vacature? So I'll let, you know, the agency do most comment. Uh, and so it's kind of tricky how that works out. But those are the six exceptions to, to, to a notice and comment rulemaking. Okay. Um, so I feel like we have time for like one or two more questions. Um, so let's let's like move on to like adjudication of these actions. Um, how do courts usually get these administrative law cases before them? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the 500s of the Administrative Procedure Act are about agency procedures and the 700s are about judicial review. Uh, and what, what the Administrative Procedure Act says that, that you, you can file an action if you have, if, the, if there's a final agency action or if there's no more action that can be taken, like it's essentially final. And so it's got to be final agency action. It can't be like a preliminary decision. It can't be you know, a lot of agencies, like if it's an immigration case, you've got to go to the immigration court first. And if you lose, then you go to the Board of Immigration Appeals. And then it's a final agency action. So there's just a lot of debate about is it final or not? Um, and once you have that, um, you know, the APA does control, but oftentimes the agency's organic statute kind of gives more details of how long you have to file and things like that. Um, the other level you have is, there's a lot of pre-enforcement review, especially rulemakings um, now. Like traditional rules, we didn't have pre-enforcement review. And then you'll probably have read Abbott Labs where we, you know, the court says, oh, you can't have pre-enforcement review of rules. Uh, and there you have a bunch of other like prudential rightness and standing questions of, 
you know, is this the right party to do this? Is, is it ripe enough that we think that the court should weigh in? Uh, and you got to look at the statute because sometimes it's just go to the district court and file this, but other times you've got to go, um, got to go to a circuit court because that's what the governing statute says. I'll note one other fun one. There's a case called Axon. This is the case where I mentioned where Paul Clement brought the Humphrey's executor challenge. The court didn't take. But the thing they did take is their challenge of the constitutionality of the appointment or the removal protections on administrative law judges. And the question was, do you have to wait until the administrative law judge issues a final decision and it's not, you know, it's, it becomes final? Or can you run to federal court right away and collaterally challenge the proceeding as unconstitutional? Fifth Circuit said you could collaterally challenge it. And the Supreme Court's going to now look at that. So there could be some collateral challenges that make your final exam a lot harder than it would have been before. <laughs> where you Because before the answer to final agency action, you have to have that. And now there may be this exception. Well, if you're raising a structural constitutional challenge about whether that agency official even has the authority under the Constitution to act, uh, then maybe you can get federal court review before then. So. Yeah, um, it is. That's that's quite interesting, and uh, you know, you know, it's great that we have to do federal courts in uh, in admin law. <laughs> oh, wait, cool. oh, so we have we have one more question. Um, uh, you know, I'll just read it straight up. This is relatively narrow and semi procedural, but what is the standard remedy for failing to satisfy the APA? I'm asking this in the context of West Virginia versus the EPA. Uh, which raised the issue of whether vacating the ACE rule would lead to reinstatement of the Obama era CPP. Namely, if you vacate a rule repealing a previous rule, does that previous rule automatically snap back into place? Does a court vacating the repealing rule have to make the express make that express or clear in order to, in its order following the uh, the judgment? Oh man, this is a good final <laughs> exam question. So. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I, the West Virginia case, I don't know, I mean, I'll, maybe I'll generalize a little bit more, but you know, when you want to get rid of a rule, I mean, it happens all the time, you know, you have a new administration, presidential administration that comes in, and the prior president administration does a bunch of what we call midnight rulemakings, where they, you know, the last couple of months, they just cram as much as they can. Some of it's like cynical that they're just trying to like get as many of their policy preferences embedded in the final rules. Other is they have this long list of things they wanted to do, and they're not just trying to get it all done. Um, the new administration has a number of ways to undo that. We could do the Congressional Review Act where you go through Congress and you kind of undo it that way, a conversation for another day. Um, the court, the, 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 the Justice Department would decide just not to defend the rule in court. So maybe there's something wrong with the rule. I guess not, it wasn't done procedurally right or there was some issue. And the third way, which is this question is getting at, is they could start a new rulemaking uh, to rescind the rule. Uh, and it's very common, it takes a while. That's why they usually try to do the other two if they can, because it doesn't take as long. Uh, but they've got to go through that whole rulemaking process to rescind it. And the general approach is that if they did it wrong, um, that you're going to vacate that rescission and, it, and the prior rule is going to go back into effect. Uh, and that's kind of the general understanding of, of how that works. Uh, that makes sense. You know, what the court could do is if they feel like it's a minor error, like maybe they just didn't give enough reasons or they could decide to um, not vacate the rule. They could remand without vacature and say, we're going to keep this rule in place, but we're going to allow the agency in the interim to kind of fix the defects. Um, with this like, particular question, the Wisconsin and Western University EPA, I mean, giving it a standard remedy, I don't know about the more, like in this particular case, I have to think through more, you know, what was the prior rule? Where was it? What was the status of it at the time? I mean, so many, there's huge questions in this case about, do the parties even have standing to do this? I mean, I'm somewhat puzzled how the, how the case made it to the Supreme Court, uh, you know, along those lines. But getting back to the original question, like the, no, the standard remedy would be to just rescind the rule, whatever was there before would be the, you know, it would be the, the law of the land until the agency acted differently. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes sense. Um, I think we have one minute left, so. Any any fun facts? Any any cool things you want to say for one minute? <laughs> yeah, I mean, administrative law is fun. I, I do, you know. I just I hope that as you're taking administrative law, you ask the bigger questions of, you know, who should decide. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of ways that's what administrative law is about. Uh, should it be courts? Should it be Congress? Should it be the president? We haven't even talked about the president here yet. 
um, or should it be agencies? And, and not just that, but who within the agency should decide? Should it be a political appointee? Should it be a principal officer? Should it be an inferior officer? Should we allow the civil service to have some insulation to make decisions based on expertise only and not policy or politics? Uh, and I think that's one of the fun things as I read through these cases, I always tell my students, like, think about it, like as a policy matter, who do you think should decide? And it turns out you don't get to choose. <laughs> the constitution provides some answers, Congress has provided some answers, and then just norms of, of judicial doctrines and how agencies operate through internal administrative law provide a lot of the answers too. So I think those are some of the fun backdrop questions that, that you have when you're taking a class in administrative law. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm certainly happy that I had this, this review, very useful review. Um, and I think these questions are super interesting and they are, I mean, as you said, they're, they're a good way to, to think about government. They're a good way. To, and like look, learning about them is a good way to, I guess, get into government if you want to do that. Um, so this has been amazing. This has been, I, I really uh, enjoyed this. Thank you to the Federal Society for putting this on. Um, and I think that's pretty much all the time we have. Uh, awesome. So yeah, thank you everyone for coming out uh, and, and really appreciate it. Uh, have a great night and uh, have a pleasant tomorrow.